Hey, everybody. I wish I could uh, speak Spanish, <laughs> but I can't. So um, uh, I'm learning, but I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at it. So anyway, um, yeah, so at Myrna, as Myrna mentioned, um, I'm going to, so what I'm going to do is sort of talk about um, uh, my, my research very much focuses on um, sort of understanding the tree of life and and what those what the different groups on the tree of life are doing right um, and so <clears throat> um, I as Mirna mentioned I've been doing uh, metagenomics which is essentially reconstructing um, genomes from nature um, since for 15 years now um, so so my lab studies microbes right and so um, um, I like to show this image just to sort of get us all on the same page, right? So microbes are, are obviously small, but they're, they're really important in, on our planet's um, geochemical cycling. And so this is an image of like the surface oceans from um, um, during the winter. And it's showing, you know, where there's these like warmer, hotter colors, there's more microbial activity um, in the surface ocean. And this is essentially phytoplankton um, bacteria and mostly um, algae, you know, they're, that are fixing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and releasing oxygen, right? So really like good example of how important microbes are is that, you know, roughly half the oxygen we're breathing right now um, comes from the surface oceans, right? So they're really, really important in terms of carbon and oxygen, but also microbes are involved in a lot of different processes in nature, right? And so if we sort of look at this in terms of like what, what ourselves can do in most animals um, is that we essentially eat carbon, uh, organic carbon and we um, breathe oxygen, right? And so um, microbes can do a whole slew of different things, right? They can, they can sulfur, um, cycle sulfur, um, iron, manganese, um, hydrogen, a whole bunch of other things. This is just a really, really short list, right? So um, uh, this is a piece of pyrite, you know, showing that how microbes can actually eat into rocks, iron rocks, um, and, and degrade them. And so in, in, not only in terms of like the, the, the sheer numbers of microbes and how important they are in our, in our climate or our elemental cycling, um, they're, they're the most abundant organisms on life. So if you take a, a drop of water um, from any anything really, and, and you put it under a microscope and you stain it with DNA, this is what you see, right? So you see a bunch of really small dots and each one of these dots is either a virus or a, a microbe of some sort, right? And I like to show this image because it's very, it reminds me of sort of looking at the sky at night, right? And so just for fun, if we think about the number of microbes just in the oceans and compare it to the number of stars in the universe, there's way more microbes out there than there are stars in the universe, right? And so th this sort of like the, the, the idea here is, right, that what we do as biologists is very much in a lot of ways similar at, at the moment to what astronomers do when they're trying to understand the universe, right? We really don't know all that much. And I'll show you that in, this, in later on, right? Most of the stuff that's out there, we don't even, we can't even say what species it is, or we don't even know um, in many cases, what, what the taxonomy of them are. So essentially like basic questions in terms of our understanding of biology of the oceans and everywhere else essentially is what's out there, right? And so we're driven by the tools just like astronomers are, um, driven by essentially the, the better telescopes they can make. Um, we're very much driven by the tools that we have available um, to understand microbes in nature. And right, so what are these tools? Um, so classically, microbiology has relied on culturing, right? So taking your sample from the environment, putting it on a plate and getting it to grow in the laboratory. So once you can get it to grow in the laboratory, you can do all sorts of great experiments. You can do physiology, you can look at it under a microscope, you can do um, imaging and stuff. Um, but the problem is that um, we now know through sort of gene sequencing that a really small proportion of the microbes that are present in nature have actually been grown in the laboratory. So um, 
vast majority of stuff that's present out there um, hasn't been grown, so we don't know much about it. And I would argue that even if we could culture all the stuff that's out there, it's going to behave differently when you have it in a laboratory. Um, you have it away out of its environment, you have it away from its partners and it, the rest of the community, it's going to behave differently, right? So one of the huge um, re revolutions in biology and microbiology has been DNA sequencing. And so my lab primarily uses DNA sequence to understand um, microbial communities in nature. And so what specifically is this? So we, it's, you know, the term is coined as, as metagenomics, right? So essentially what metagenomics is, is going out, taking a sample, extracting all the DNA from that sample, and then sequencing it and you get small pieces, right? And you assemble that um, into, um, hopefully occasionally you do get complete genomes, but usually you don't. Um, and, so you have to sort of bin things into, into individual fragments and to, to know which it came from. But once you have a genome from the environment, um, you're able to access sort of the first um, description of that organism. So in often cases, when we get genomes, very rarely is it a genome that we've seen before. Um, and sometimes it's even completely new phyla of life, like completely new branch on the tree of life, right? And so once we have that genome, we can sort of understand who it is and we can look at its gene contents to understand what the the pathways are that it has um, so for instance there's an example where this organism can use um, sulfur and nitrogen i won't go into the details of this and i think that's what this workshop is about but um, these are just a list of some of the tools that we use um, there's other approaches that my lab uses which i won't go into today but we where you essentially confirm we do experiments in bottles and you know, using Boncad and SIP um, and Mir's done, Mir has done some of this work in my lab where um, you essentially confirm the, what the genome is telling you that the organism is actually doing that process, right? So reconstructing genomes from nature is really, really challenging. So this is a cartoon from, a, from the Human Genome Project, um, but it's, it's very similar. Um, essentially, the, the techniques that are used with the human genome is, is similar to what the same thing we use in microbes, right? So it, if you think about it as essentially instead of like the human genome being one puzzle, um, you're taking hundreds of puzzles. Take, so if you go out to a soil sample and you've got, say you've got a thousand species, just for instance, you, you essentially have a thousand puzzles that you're dumping on the table because you're getting individual reads, right? And you have to sort those pieces out into the puzzle that they came from, right? So this is where the bioinformatics part of all this comes in, right? So this is where there's been huge innovations in, in advances in techniques and reconstructing genomes in the last 15 years. Um, it's really changing things. There's also been huge advances, of course, in DNA sequencing approaches. So um, when, so essentially when the first bacterial genome was sequenced in the early 90s, um, there, um, um, it took a huge effort, several, several, lots of people and they were using Sanger sequencing at the time to when we first started doing metagenomes, um, we would get like dozens of genomes at a time, right? So in the, it was around 2004 was the first metagenome that was published. And that's because we're getting with each sequencer technology, we're getting more and more reads and we're able to reconstruct more genomes essentially. And so now we're at the point where through Illumina um, primarily is what we use where you get um, huge numbers of huge amounts of sequence that are that you can generate thousands of hundreds to thousands of genomes from from natural samples. So it's really really um, exciting. It's really changing things. So I want to step back a bit. And I want to talk about the tree of life, right? So what is this concept of the tree of life and where it originated? It came from Darwin. And so there's this cool drawing from his field notebook he wrote he drew in um, 1837 where he wrote I think and then he drew this this tree in his notebook and it and it's really amazing to think that what he was seeing in the natural world without DNA sequencing without anything was you know how he was envisioning evolution to occur right so that's the idea where essentially you have this tree that represents um, common ancestors right so and you can think of it as, as moving through time so down here at the bottom 
is early on, like the first organisms and then it diverges and, and you get new branches of life, right? So that's essentially the tree of life. And there's certain organisms that go extinct, but we don't have, you know, and like crazy microbes, we often don't have genomes for them. Um, yeah. So then in uh, the, um, uh, I guess the, it started in the late seventies, but also in the eighties, this guy, Carl Woese, um came up with this idea of taking Darwin's sort of tree of this concept of a tree and actually using DNA sequence to, to make an actual map of that tree, okay? And so um, this is just an example, right? So you take a bunch of different organisms, you take the DNA sequence, you compare it, and you generate this tree. And essentially the distances between any two organisms on this tree is a measure of how different their DNA sequence is, right? So the closer their DNA sequence is to each other, the closer they're gonna be on the tree, essentially. And he came up with this new, he realized that essentially microbes is two groups, the bacteria and archaea, right? And there's basically everything you can see over here, right? And so this sort of evolved more with uh, more and more sequencing um, and this paper by Norm Pace in 1997. And so this is essentially showing the three domains of life that as Carl was describing, the bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And essentially each one of these is a different species, right? So a different bacteria. So here, what's astonishing is, so what you're starting to see is you're seeing these groups that are called PSLs, right? So, or, or PJPs. These are essentially sequences that came from the environment, in this case, Yellowstone Hot Springs, that um, we didn't have cultured representatives for. And this is what led us to realize that there's a bunch of culture groups out there that we haven't seen. Right, so just as an example, right? So here's essentially you and I, this is a mushroom, right? So it's pretty crazy to look at this tree and think, okay, that's, that's how different those things are and that's how close they are on this tree. Basically everything that we can see with the naked eye is this small little branch on the eukaryotes, right? So all this other diversity on the tree is microbial. It's microscopic, right? Um, and so this sort of led to what I like to call the Hubble moment. Um, so from metagenomics, like this tree was based on one gene, right? And it was based on a, a small number of sequences that we had at the time. Then sort of like the, my analogy to astronomy, like the, the Hubble telescope went up and it took these images of space that people had never seen before. Well, metagenomics, reconstructing genomes from the environment is leading to a very similar thing among within the tree of life, where essentially we're seeing all these new branches of life that have not been um, cultured. They've not, many, most of them haven't had genomes that have been um, obtained for them before. And now we have genomes for them, right? So you'll notice the trees change quite a bit. There's a lot more branches. Of course, each one of these branches now is not an individual gene, it's an entire genome. And anywhere there's a name here is essentially like a sort of a named taxa. It's usually a phylum. Um, and so um, you'll notice now that the bacteria are all up on the upper part of this tree. And anywhere there's a red dot on this tree, that means that there's the group has not been grown in the laboratory. So it hasn't been cultured. And now you can see the eukary eukaryotes are down here, um, us, and then the archaea are down here. So it's sort of Genomic genomics is really changing the, the shape of the tree and in, in addition to like expanding the tree, right? And there's this huge, what's really amazing to me is there's this huge group off to the right here of that's called the CPR or candidate phyla radiation. Essentially, it's like essentially like 40% of the bacterial diversity we hadn't known about before reconstructing genomes, really. Um, yeah, and so there's this. Uh, quote by um, Jonathan Eisen when this paper came out. This is humbling because holy bleep, we know virtually nothing about right now about the biology of most of the tree of life, right? So um, it's true, right? We don't know, we have genomes for them now, but we don't actually um, know a whole lot about their biology, but we're starting to learn about it through their genomes, right? And so here, just to show you like this, this CPR, this is, this is essentially highlighting all the cult culture groups the groups that have not been cultured, right? And there's this huge group over here that hasn't been cultured. And so um, this is sort of um, essentially sort of shifted our understanding and that there was this nice um, review of a paper that came out around the time where it shows it in a tree form. 
just to sort of summarize things. So within the bacteria, there was roughly 75 phyla that were known. Um, archaea, there's less. Um, and you see there's this deep split, right? And, uh, and there's this interesting thing that happened to the tree now with metagenomics is that the eukaryotes branch off the archaea, um, which is a new thing. But then you also have these groups, the CPR and the DPEN um, within these, within the archaean bacteria that we're finding that appear to be um, really, really small cells, right? So their genomes are really small in, you know, they're usually um, around a megabase at the most, the some are down to like just half a megabase. So really small genomes, the genomes essentially the, are getting close to the size of large viruses essentially. And in the few cases where we've seen my, microscopic images of these cells, they're really, really small too. So this is one of these DPAN archaea. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's only about 300 nanometers in diameter. So it's about the size of a virus. Um, so it's pretty astonishing. And when you look at, um, when you look at the, the genes that these things have, the, the DPAN and the CPR, these deeply branched groups, they, um, they have very, they're missing a lot of really important things. They're missing key respiratory pathways. Um, they, they can't even, a lot of them can't even produce their own, make their own nucleotides. They can't make some amino acids um, or membranes. Um, and so the, 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 the thought is that, and the, is that all these organisms are essentially relying on other organisms in the environment to survive. So they're taking up amino acids from other things. And when you look at um, images of these in the environment, you find that here's one of these um, small cells here. There's actually this connection um, to another cell of some sort, which we don't really understand. This is a close up view of the membrane. Um, so we don't understand what's going on, but they're probably essentially um, scavenging or par they're parasitic. There's, there's a symbiosis of some sort between these organisms and other organisms. Okay. So um, my lab does, I'll just put this. Uh, um, so my lab does a lot of work in the oceans, as I mentioned. And so I just show this to, to, to this is a, from a cruise where we were on in the Gulf of California, just off the coast of Mexico, off just um, um, near Guaymas actually, um, where we were collecting samples in 2018. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of work from this, from these cruises and, and some of the key findings that we've gotten from it. So why do we study uh, marine sediments? Well, um, it, marine sediments are really essentially really important in the global carbon cycle, right? So in the surface ocean, there's an, uh, an uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, and uh, by phytoplankton. And as that, all that sort of bio biomaterial sinks eventually, it reaches the sediments. And so as a result, marine sediments contain one of the largest pools of organic carbon on the planet. So understanding the microbes and how they're processing that organic carbon on the ocean floor is really, really important in climate change. The problem is that when we look at microbes on the ocean floor, essentially nothing has been cultured. And there's been very little understanding of things other than sort of methanogens and sulfate reducers. So this is a tree of archaea, an updated tree of just the archaea. And if and so again, the red dots are uncultured groups, right? Anywhere that there's an arrow here is a is a group that's very um, very abundant in marine sediments. And if you look in, you know, most of these sort of haven't been cultured, right? So the the sort of we're this is sort of a missing link in our understanding of a of carbon cycling on the planet and the oceans is that we don't know much about the microbes that are there doing this work, right? And so um, if you look at sort of like from all the genomes that have been tamed from archaea, there's been a, a realization that, that these, these genomes have really important processes without going into the details here, just, just, just to show it, right? So these genomes have a bunch of pathways and genes that are capable of doing really important steps in nutrient cycling, carbon cycling, and in, in the oceans, right? And so um, trying to understand them is a key. So here's the, the site that I want to talk about. Um, 
for the rest of the talk. Um, so here's Guaymas, right? This is if when you get down there on the bottom, you look at the sediments, there's this, um, you can see there are these like microbial mats that are there. There's, um, um, they're like yellow and orange and the really bright colors are not, they can't really see it from these pictures, but essentially it's a really dynamic environment. So you have these microbial mats where the sort of the hot fluids or this hydrothermal fluids are venting up and releasing sulfur. And there's, there's you know, you go a few, a few, a meter or two away it's a very different environment. So it's a really, really dynamic environment. We've, we've now collected over 45 different, we've looked at 45 different <clears throat> communities at, in Guaymas Basin, um, and we're doing up to a billion reads per sample. And sort of just to show this, right? So this is depth here from different sites. These are different mats. And then, and then this is temperature. So the, the, the warmer the color is, the more the temperature is, right? So in some places, it gets really hot, really shallow. In other places, like off away from the mats, there's less, the temperature doesn't go up that much. So these are really like thermophilic, they're really hot environments essentially. And so what we do is when we go out, we, we do metagenomics, we reconstruct a bunch of genomes, and then we go through those genomes and we look for certain pathways that are important and genes that are really important in understanding the, the ecology of the, of the environment. So this is a really broad view. Don't worry about the details, right? Just to give you a sense of that, this is like big data, right? We have a bunch of, of different new microbial groups that we've obtained genomes for, and we're looking at different pathways like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur, right? Um, so here's another site. I just like, uh, sorry, I'm skipping around a little bit, but this is another site that we work on. It's, it's an estuary itself in the US. Um, and what you can do once you have all these genomes is you can you can say you can sort of reconstruct the flow of you can make like a food web of a microbial community, right? So once we have all the genomes, we can say, okay, this organism, this spirochete, eats cellulose and it gives off ethanol, right? So that it gives us a way to say, okay, well then that ethanol is then taken up by you know this delta brody bacteria and so on. So it's really the metagenomics reconstructing genomes from the environment is really powerful because it can give you the ability sort to sort of go through and understand who's doing what, what their ecological roles are for the first time, right? You couldn't do this before because you can't culture many things um, from the environment. The other thing that metagenomics gives you the ability to is um, find new um, microbial groups. And so one of these is, um, this group uh, named after Thomas Brock. He was a, a famous microbiologist that worked on hot springs. Um, and so this is a completely new phylum of life. So it, it falls here on the tree essentially. Um, and when we found it originally at Guaymas and then um, through collaborators, we found, we found that they're really, really widespread in hot springs all over the world. Um, so they're um, pretty important. So the interesting thing is, so we look, when we look at their metabolism, they're, they're capable of doing a lot of different things based on the different groups that are there. Um, without going into too much detail, um, they're able to do fermentation. They can do methylotrophy, so they can use um, um, methyl, methylated carbon compounds and they can do p methylotrophy. So they play sort of an important role in, in the environment where they can, these are the only archaea that we've, that we know of so far that can that can take up methylated compounds, but they don't produce methane. They just incorporate it essentially. Yeah. The other sort, instead of like sort of looking at completely new phyla, my lab has also looked at um, groups that we thought we understood pretty well, like the delta proteobacteria. So delta proteobacteria are are really widespread in sediments and soils and lots of environments. Um, and they're commonly thought to, to do sulfate reduction um, and sort of iron cycling. Um, but what we did was we took from Guaymas, we took a bunch of new delta proteobacteria genomes that we had, and we took a bunch from public databases and we generated this tree. And just to look at how all these new genomes are changing the, the tree of life um, in, in within these bacteria. And we also compared their, all the proteins within the within each of the genomes to the other genomes. 
sort of did we cluster them essentially. And so what that gave us is anywhere on this outer ring where you see a color, that's a certain cluster of genomes that have similar proteins, similar genes within their genomes. Okay. Um, so here's cluster A, you can see it kind of fits here. And then there's cluster B kind of drops in here. So one of the things you notice is that the, the clusters sort of don't really follow the tree. And so the point, because what I'm trying to say here is that essentially you can't rely, you can't just say, okay, I have this group. So it's probably doing the same thing as this group, right? They, these, these two groups that, you know, are similar on the tree can have intents and have, can be doing completely different things in the environment. Um, so, yeah. And so then we went and looked and we said, okay, what are all these clusters of genomes doing? And so um, I won't go into details here, but essentially some groups can do sulfate reduction, some do nitrogen reduction, others can use hydrocarbons. There's a bunch of different things that these bacteria can do. So within just one of these sort of like phyla within the tree of life, there's a huge amount of metabolism that's present that you can examine. Okay, I'm going to switch gears for the rest of my talk. I'm going to talk about um, these, what are called Asgard archaea, and they're um, um, sort of the kind of the main focus of my lab at the moment. So if we sort of step back and we look at the tree of archaea from um, around, you know, early on in the 90s and uh, essentially, we only had essentially the sort of two groups that were defined there, the Uriarchaea and the Chronarchaea. Then um, there are starting to be more groups that were defined um, in the 2000s. And now we're at this point where we have huge numbers of a bunch of new groups, essentially from all the genomes that are being constructed, right? And one of these groups is what's called the, so um, this is called the Asgards, they're named after Norse gods. They're essentially, this is a, a group of archaeal phyla that fall deep within the tree, right? And so there's this great, um, we were, I was reading, we were reading this paper in one of my classes, and I thought this was a really cool quote by Carl Rose from 2000, where he said, the deepest branchings of the tree takes us into uncharted evolutionary waters. The doors of understanding early, earlier, more primitive forms of life have opened, has opened. I thought that was really cool because he, all, he, all he was looking at the time was 16S in single gene sequences, but he was sort of saying that, you know, things, this is, we're, we're exploring new branches on the tree of life and we're learning new things about the evolution of life. And a really good example of this is the archaea, the Asgard archaea. So this paper in 2015 came out where they obtained this group they called Loki Archaea after, uh, the, after the, um, this hydrothermal event um, called Loki's Castle in the North Atlantic. And then around that same time, my lab had found another group um, that, we, that was similar to Loki, what we call them Thor. So um, they're, they're named after Norse gods, obviously not, or you can say they're Marvel characters if you want, but. Um, they're really interesting because when you add these Asgards to the tree of life, the eukaryotes fall within the archaea, right? So that's that tree when I showed you before, the eukaryotes are down here and the Asgards are there. That, that um, they, adding these Asgards to the tree of life has essentially brought the eukaryotes into the archaea. What this means is that there were theories about this being true, is that the, the eukaryotes shared a common ancestor with the Asgards. So they evolved from the same ancestor at some point in the past, right? That's the big implication. And that's a, a really big change in the way things were thought of compared to what, you know, Carl Wills' tree, which is the three domains of life, they're separate. Um, so we set out at the time, there were just the, the Loki and Thor. So um, my lab and, and another lab set out to look for more of these genomes from different places, right? And so we found, um, um, so now we have Loki and Thor and now there's Odin and Heimdall, right? And the big finding from this paper was that essentially it looked like the eukaryotes, us, evolved and as a, a most closely related relatives are the Heimdall archaea, um, and which is this group here. So one specific group within the Asgards, right? So one, like, I guess the big, takeaway from my talk is that we are as guardian, right? 
Um, and so how does this train to the tree of life? This is a, like a really simple way to show it. Essentially, we have bacteria over here, we have the archaea, and then we have eukaryotes that evolved from this, right? So now it's sort of, so if you want to say, instead of the three domains of life, you have the two domains of life. So this is a huge shift in our understanding of the tree of life, as well as understanding the evolution and where eukaryotes came from, okay? And so if you open up a biology textbook, right, you're going to see this image where there's a prokaryote, this simple cell, fairly simple cell, and then there's a eukaryote, right? Very different organisms, which is why people classify them as being different. Um, you know, there's, there's nucleus for one, there's all sorts of internal structures within a eukaryote. But what's interesting is if you look at Asgard genomes, they have what appear to be a bunch of genes that are involved in making complex cells what they are, right? So cytoskeleton, um, I won't go through these, but a bunch of different things. So basically genes that had only been seen in, in eukaryotes before. So here's essentially eukaryotes and they have all these different genes. Here's these genes in different archaea. So you can see that some, some archaea have some of these. But in a lot of cases, there's, there's a bunch of genes that, that these, um, these Asgards have that are most similar to eukaryotes. And so this is just sort of like a, an, like a conceptual model of what all these different um, genes and proteins are doing in the Asgards. We don't, you know, some of these have been confirmed recently, but um, um, uh, yeah, so essentially it's a bunch of different things. So things involved in the, the endonucleus, uh, endo, uh, yeah. a bunch of different things, essentially ribosome proteins, trafficking, things that make a eukaryote carry out a complex cell, right? Oh, that's weird. Um, so, and in, in some cases there's been, the people have taken these proteins from the Asgards they've cloned them into other organisms and they've looked at their function, um, cultured organisms, because we don't have cultures of Asgards, and they've shown that they actually function like those in eukaryotes. So in this case, um, this is a profilin, um, which sort of regulates, oops, sorry, that's, that regulates actin um, in eukaryotes. So what does this mean, right? So stepping back a bit. So, there's what we have is the last common ancestor. What we have now are essentially bacteria and archaea, right? At some point in the past, we know that the mitochondria came from a, uh, an alpha proteobacteria. And we and the Asgards is telling us that the Asgards were sort of the other partner in this relationship, right? So what, <clears throat> what sort of interactions occurred between these two organisms that led to this first um, eukaryotic cell, right? And so we're looking at trying to understand the metabolisms of Asgards to understand what that relationship was. And in one of, one of the new groups of Asgards that we have that we named after Hal Arcuda, named after Hal Gauss, the underworld, we have this, what appears to be a symbiotic relationship where, where they're exchanging hydrogen with some unknown partner, right? So this sort of hints at the fact that, okay, maybe there's some sort of interaction. If we look at all the all the Asgards, it looks like they are they have the metabolic capabilities to live in symbiosis with other organisms. So potentially maybe an alpha root bacteria or other bacteria that led to this formation of the first eukaryotic cell. Um, and so this was sort of confirmed um, a couple of years ago when the first organism of the Asgards was growing in the laboratory, um, the, one of the Loki archaea, where essentially this is the Loki cell, its metabolism, and then this is a partner that was grown with it in the culture. Um, and there's an exchange of hydrogen forming between the two organisms. And so here's some images of those. And they make these, if it's real, they make these essentially these, these long arms that they, that is thought that these, you know, they sort of make this partnership with the bacterium. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. So yeah, here's my group. Um, I didn't talk about Mirna's stuff. I should have. <laughs> um, anyway, Mirna's done a lot of really cool work in my lab too, but here's the rest of my group. Um, my lab is funded by the Moore Foundation, Science Foundation, um, and thanks.